Well, first, I, I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. And I want to take this uh, opportunity to say a special word of thanks to my uh, brilliant young uh, co-authors. It's really been an honor and a privilege uh, to work with uh, Sharif and uh, Ryan. Uh, Sharif really took the lead in developing the arguments and uh, drafting uh, the original article that then turned into the book. Uh, Ryan was uh, uh, really the second uh, author, and I was a very distant third uh, author uh, on the book. So uh, I'm really grateful to you guys for, uh, for what you've done, and I just feel so privileged. You know, at a place like Princeton, I get to, I get to teach a lot of really smart students. Uh, and sometimes I run into students who are not only smart, but really brave and bold and willing to question prevailing orthodoxies and to speak their minds, uh, even when it's politically uh, incorrect. Uh, but never have I had students more brilliant or bolder and braver than, uh, than Ryan and Sharif, so it's a real privilege uh, for me. Let's look at this for a moment from the perspective of people uh, on the other side. You meet them every day, and perhaps some of you are one of them. People who really just don't see what the problem is here about recognizing same-sex partners as married. What's the big deal? In fact, what's the issue here at all? Isn't that simply a requirement of basic equality? So Henry and Joe are attracted to each other. They form an emotional bond. They want to live together, take care of each other, take responsibility for each other, look after each other. They can't uh, conceive and rear children together, but Perhaps they could adopt, might even want to. They would like to have that relationship recognized as a marriage. Then over here, there's Sally and Herman. They're attracted to each other. They form an emotional bond. They decide they want to share responsibilities, take care of each other, live together. Maybe they can't have children either. Maybe they don't even care to adopt. The state will recognize Herman and Sally as married if they wish to be married, if they wish to get a license from the state. But the state won't recognize the two guys. We've got X and Y. X and Y, just as I've described them, seem identical. The only difference seems to be a, a morally irrelevant difference, opposite sex as opposed to same sex. What's the problem? Shouldn't simple equality require us to permit the two guys to be have a relationship that's recognized as a marriage as well? Hence the very effective slogan, marriage equality. Now, for people who see no difference beyond that, for people who don't ask the next question, not only is it simple and the argument's over and it's just solved by equality, they will be incapable of seeing why other people have any problem with it, why other people don't see that equality just requires the recognition of both sets of relationships as marital. It's a simple case of treating like cases alike. Simple justice requires that. And so, if you don't see it, there must be a problem with you. At best, at best, you must have some mysterious theological reason for investing importance in sexual differentiation. But if that's your reason, that's an illegitimate reason for public policy. So that's just some private notion of yours. Or, more likely, you're a bigot. You're a bad guy. You're prejudiced. You're driven by animus against people who are same-sex attractive, self-identify as gay. It's just obvious. Now, all that presupposes something that's almost never attended to, but which Sharif brought out very well. And that is the proposition 
assumed but never brought to light, that what marriage is, is a strong emotional bond, and what distinguishes it from other forms of friendship or companionship or relationship is the intensity and prioritization of the emotional bond. And if indeed that's what marriage was, they would be right. You can't distinguish the cases, emotional bond, emotional bond, intense emotional bond, intense emotional bond. Each partner treats the other as his number one person or her number one person. They're the same, and it goes through without a hitch. But what if that assumption is wrong? What if marriage is something other than or more than an especially intense emotional bond? What if it's distinguished from other forms of companionship or friendship, not by intensity, uh, uh, intensity of emotional connection or prioritization, but something else? In other words, what if emotional bond is not the definition of marriage? They assume there's no alternative. But the alternative understanding of marriage is the one that has been around since the dawn of human civilization, that has been embraced by every major tradition, religious or secular, in human history of which I am aware that has been embraced by and defended by the great thinkers and teachers of mankind from those Sharif mentioned, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Musonius, Plutarch, through Augustine, Aquinas, the writers of the scriptures, Immanuel Kant and other enlightenment philosophers, to Mahatma Gandhi. That alternative conception is what we call the conjugal understanding of marriage, the conjugal conception of marriage, the idea of marriage not as an emotional bond, but as a conjugal union. And Sharif <laughs> explained very well what a conjugal union is and what distinguishes it from a mere emotional bond. A conjugal union is comprehensive. It's a comprehensive union in the sense that it unites people not only along the dimension of heart and mind, but along the bodily dimension too. First in the conjugal act, an act that fulfills the behavioral conditions of procreation and remains exactly that sort of act and capable of consummating marriage according to law, historically, quite apart from any questions of same-sex anything. That kind of act is the conjugal act, the marital act, and in the child who will, under conditions where the non-behavioral uh, uh, conditions of, of procreation obtain, produce the child who is the living embodiment of the mother and the father, the husband and the wife. Marriage, in other words, to put it in biblical terms, although the Bible here is simply articulating a premise that is embraced by so many other philosophical traditions and great thinkers who have been outside of the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, the, the, the Bible's conception of a one flesh union, a true bodily union a union that's made possible by sexual reproductive complementarity and is truly part of a comprehensive union because the body properly understood is not a mere subpersonal instrument of the human being, which is what is presupposed by the revisionist view of marriage as merely an emotional bond, but is rather part of the personal reality of the human being. So if marriage unites two persons comprehensively, then it must unite those two persons not only emotionally and psychologically, but in the bodily dimension of their being as well. And so, since there are two alternative understandings of what marriage is that are available, the question that must be asked and answered before we can move one centimeter toward understanding what equality does and doesn't require is the question, what is marriage? That's why we entitled the book, What is Marriage? It's the prior question. It's the fundamental question. The only way that the redefinition of marriage argument works is by presupposing the very issue that's in dispute the question of what marriage is, which is why you simply never see people who are advocating the redefinition of marriage raise the question, what is marriage, 
or offer an answer to the question. We have challenged them in venues all over the country and as Sharif said in some foreign countries. Give us your alternative understanding of what marriage is. We get no answer. It's an answer, they, it's a question they don't want to engage because they want the uncritical accepted assumption to be that marriage is an emotional union. What distinguishes it from other unions again is just its intensity, its prioritization. But, again, as Sharif pointed out, if that's true, then everything else that we've understood about marriage falls away, and even those dimensions of marriage, the norms concerning marriage, which remain broadly in the, in the country uncontroversial, collapse. We can have no principled reason for the following things, and I'll simply repeat them because they're very important. On the emotional union understanding of marriage, we have no reason for believing that marriage is a sexual relationship, inherently a sexual relationship at all, as opposed to a relationship integrated around other shared interests or activities, playing tennis together, reading novels, whatever. We have no reason to believe that marriages are the unions of two and only two persons, as opposed to three or four or more triads, quadrats, so forth, in polyamorous sexual partnerships. Sure, if marriage is simply an intense emotional bond, two men or two women can be married just as much as a man and a woman. But by the very same token, so can three or four or five people in a polyamorous union, which candid and clear thinking and honest proponents of the redefinition of marriage freely concede. And we give you quotation after quotation, as Ryan pointed out in the book. Further, it can't explain why marriage requires exclusivity and sexual fidelity. Why we shouldn't have what Dan Savage, a leading advocate of redefining marriage, is promoting. That is open marriages, as opposed to marriage as a closed institution. Nor finally can explain why marriage should be uh, a relationship involving permanence of commitment, as opposed to temporary commitments, or term commitments, or commitments for as long as love lasts. Now having said all that, I want to stress that. What makes it possible, what has made it possible, for people even to reconceive or to conceive of the possibility of same-sex marriage is the collapse of the broader marriage culture on which civilization had relied under the pressure of developments and ideologies that had nothing to do with same-sex anything, but which have transmitted a message that we can go back, we, we can trace back to Margaret Sanger, Alfred Kinsey, Hugh Hefner, an idea of sexuality uh, and of uh, human uh, uh, romantic relationships purely as emotional unions. Once that idea becomes widespread, once we lose the sense of marriage as a conjugal union, then in due course, eventually the chickens come home to roost, and people will lose any sense of why marriage should be a gendered institution at all. And pretty soon after that, we lose any sense of why it should be exclusive, two and not three, permanent, and so forth. So the struggle which we have committed ourselves, which I hope you will commit yourselves, to preserve the conjugal understanding of marriage in our law, rather than to replace it with a different institution to which the label marriage is reassigned, this concept of an emotional bond or sexual romantic domestic partnership. We've committed ourselves, we hope you'll commit yourself to preserving that only as a first step, only to make possible the steps that we would need to take, even if there were no debate over the definition of marriage. The steps that I and others struggled to begin the culture on the road to in the 19, late 70s and early 1980s in the marriage movement. That is to rebuild a strong and healthy and vibrant marriage culture in which marriage is understood as a relationship that uh, uh, is oriented toward children and the rearing of children together where parents find their fulfillment in being in, a, in the type of relationship that's naturally ordered to children and which uh, uh, provides the uniquely apt setting for children, where they find fulfillment in that relationship even if they themselves cannot, for extrinsic reasons, have children, and where the odds are maximized that children will grow up 
knowing and being known by, loving and being loved by their biological mother and their biological father, nurtured in the bond, the marital bond of mom and dad. That's the goal. We paid a hugely heavy price. Children have paid a hugely heavy price. Society's paid a hugely, paid a hugely heavy price for the breakdown of our marriage culture, for a circumstance in which it's as likely as not that children will not be raised with their mom and their dad in the loving marital bond. For the sake of children, we need to recover that. We need to restore that. It's absolutely critically important to the health of our society and our civilization. And that fundamentally is what we're fighting for. It's not fundamentally about same-sex anything. It's certainly not about homosexuality. It's about rebuilding the marriage culture. The reason that we've got to preserve the definition and understanding of marriage in our law is that it's a precondition for overturning the misguided understanding of marriage as an emotional union and restoring in the culture the idea of marriage as a truly conjugal union. That's what we're fighting for.